Good morning, everyone. I thought it would be good to take some time today to look back at how much has changed over the last three months. On March 13th, I declared a state of emergency in response to the coronavirus, which had only just been named a worldwide pandemic that week and took several steps to help control the spread of the virus, protect our most vulnerable, and keep our health care system from being overwhelmed. Over the two weeks that followed, we expanded those restrictions, including putting a stay home, stay safe order in place, asking Vermonters to leave their homes only for essential purposes, as well as closing schools and in-person operations for most businesses. After a month, our modeling showed that, thanks to the sacrifices of Vermonters, we had flattened the curve, meaning we slowed the spread of the virus and changed our trajectory. This work saved hundreds of lives. Since then, we began slowly reopening the economy and loosening some restrictions, one quarter turn of the spigot at a time. So we can make sure these moves didn't dramatically increase the spread of the virus to put our health care system back at risk. And we continue to see good signs from our data, which has meant we can forge ahead, getting more Vermonters back to work and back to social and physical activity that's also important to our well-being. However, it's not all good news because in recent weeks, we've been dealing with an outbreak in the Winooski area. And while this has caused an uptick in new cases, we've stayed well below the thresholds we've set. For example, our positivity rate, meaning percent of positive cases, our tests out of total tests, has remained between 1 to 2.5%. Our growth rate is back. Our growth rate is back uh, below one percent, and our case count outside of the outbreak has remained very low. We're managing this by aggressively testing and tracing in the region, so we can surround it and box it in. And I want to thank the team at the Department of Health and our local partners for their incredible work, which is still ongoing. This is an example of how things have changed since early March. At that time, we knew very little about the virus. In fact, nobody did. And most of us didn't know what social distancing was or think twice about how long we took to wash our hands. We also didn't have the testing capacity or inventory of life-saving equipment and PPE like masks and shields that we do today. You see, staying home in March and April didn't just flatten the curve and save lives. It also gave us the time to learn, growing our testing and tracing program and supply chains, build our PPE and ventilator stock, and put health and safety procedures in place across all sectors. And it made us more aware of our own behavior, which has been key, and the small things each of us can and must do to help limit the spread of this virus until a vaccine is developed. Each of these things show why we've been able to slowly reopen and lift restrictions, and why, when we see outbreaks, it won't require the same drastic action we had to take in March. At the same time, we have to be smart here at home, and we have to remember Vermont is not an island and that this isn't over. We still have about 130,000 active cases within a five-hour drive of us. That's about 20% of our population. This is why I've taken a cautious approach, because we have to watch the impacts of each step we take, as well as those of our neighbors as well. But the fact is, we've been moving forward. All sectors are open to at least some capacity. We've increased gathering sizes, let family and friends get together, open childcare, and ease quarantine requirements for travel between Vermont in other states. And today, we're opening up outdoor lodging, meaning campgrounds, to 100%. And if our data continues to show we're moving in the right direction, you'll see us open more things further. As a reminder, none of these steps are taken without the approval of the health department uh, and uh, the EPI team. They work side by side with ACCD and public safety to provide the guidance for reopening. I say all this because I know that with every move we make, some believe it's way too much, too fast, 
and others believe it's way too little and too slow. I hear and understand the concerns on both sides, but there are no easy answers or simple solutions, and there's certainly no roadmap. So we'll continue to move forward under the guidance of the health experts and based on the trends we're seeing both in Vermont and around the region. Because if we get everything open in the right way and continue to test and trace to fight outbreaks, then we won't have to retreat, which will be better for the economy and our quality of life in the long term. To continue to manage this reality, the fact is the state of emergency must remain in place. So I've extended it again to July 15th. But remember, the state of emergency is just a vehicle or a mechanism to do all the things we need to do to manage our response. It's not the, the same thing as the stay at home order. And it doesn't mean all restrictions stay in place. In fact, it gives us a way to lift them when the time is right. Now, I know this has felt like a very long journey already. And so much uncertainty remains. And you're tired of it and just want it to be over. I can relate. But if we continue to stay smart, use common sense and take care of each other, we will get through this. I know we can do this and we can do it together. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. What I'd like to do this morning is a brief update on our numbers, brief update on Winooski, and a discussion regarding serology testing. As you can see, we're at 1,128 cases. It has been way over two weeks since we've had any deaths, thank goodness, so we remain at 55. You can look at our kind of curve of cases, and obviously we had a change in the slope of our curve related to the up outbreak. You'll notice a sense of leveling off again, getting similar to where we started, and that's uh, further supported by looking at the number of new cases, which is continuing to down trend. Now I have to be careful here and tell you that um, we did not do specific testing in Burlington or Winooski at, at pop-up sites over the weekend. Having said that though, we're averaging 1,364 tests per day over the last week. So there have been plenty of opportunities for testing uh, related to that outbreak and across the state. The uh, percent positivity is continuing to be very, very low, well below 2%. And we continue to have very similar syndromic surveillance data showing few visits to emergency rooms or urgent cares for COVID-like symptoms or flu-like symptoms. Interestingly, if uh, you look at the map um, of the country, we continue to hear concerns about minimum of 20, often 20 plus states that have had uh, issues with increasing cases in very recent days to week, uh, some attributed to their reopening process. Um, our curve, when it was going upwards again, clearly was related to a single outbreak in the state. We went actually from the um, CNN designation of one of the states that had one of the highest rates of increase to overnight having one of the most dramatically different states in the other direction uh, with very little going on in terms of case positivity. Um, so one has to be careful when one looks at data all the time. Regarding Winooski, we remain at 83 total cases. Again, still 60% adults, 40% children, and less than 20% in the range of symptomatic, now down to 17% in that population. Continue to have a low median age of 22. I reported last week that there was a hospitalization associated with this, but on further analysis, we've determined the hospitalization's actually not related to this outbreak. So, 
This outbreak continues to have zero hospitalizations associated with it. And as I've been reporting each time, the number of contacts is still about the same as the number of cases at 78. And um, I think that's all you need to know from the numbers standpoint at, at this point in time. I've been promising for some time a little discussion about the results from the deliberations of the serology working group, which has really met a number of times in the last couple of weeks. First, I want to talk about the tests themselves that are used to test people for antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The FDA has recognized the deficits of many of the current tests and it's really started to tighten its regulatory authority over the manufacturers. It now requires that tests have a sufficient sensitivity, and remember sensitivity is the ability of a test to correctly identify those with a disease, and a sufficient specificity, which is the ability of a test to correctly identify those who don't have the disease, and they have to report these within 10 days of getting an emergency use authorization. So keep in mind a test with a really, really good sensitivity and specificity, those numbers will be in the 99% range. There are now at least four testing platforms that the working group has identified that have sensitivity and specificity in that range. Now you might think that these are incredibly accurate and worth doing, but to explain why that might not be true, I do need to explain a few concepts to everyone. So I'm going to use this as a teachable moment, but bear with me. Um, if it does nothing else, it'll allow you, when you go to your doctor next time and think you want a test for some condition, to understand why the doctor may be enthusiastic or reluctant to order that test, um, and why you need to understand the implications of doing that test and what the result means. So the first concept we'll talk about is pre-test probability. Before even doing the test, how likely is it that you have the condition that you're worried about having? What's the likelihood that you might test positive? So if you think you've had exposure to SARS-CoV-2 virus, even though you may not have actually been sick, what is your pre-test probability of that being true when we do the antibody test? Well, that really relates to how much of the virus is circulating in the community at the time that you're uh, worried about. And all along, I've been pretty consistent in saying we don't think there's been a high level of virus circulating in the community, either in the U.S., except in select places, or in Vermont. And you can tell that by looking at our percent positivity rates, looking at our rates of new cases, et cetera. The best guess is that under 5% of Vermonters may have been exposed to the virus th thus far. So if a Vermonter wanted to have this antibody test done, they'd have to realize right from the get-go that the probability of having a positive test was low from the start. In addition to pre-test probability, what about post-test probability? In other words, once you get the test result, how likely is that result to reflect reality? So the positive predictive value of a test is the probability that a person who has a positive test result really does have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 virus. To figure that out, you need to know how good the test is, the sensitivity and specificity as I've been discussing, and then how prevalent is the SARS-CoV-2 in our population. So if you're in a state or a country with a lot of SARS-CoV-2 around, you'll have a really high positive predictive value of the test, and if you get a positive test result, it's pretty likely you've had antibodies to the virus. But the opposite is also true, and as the prevalence of the virus in the population gets lower and lower, the likelihood that a positive test result is a true positive becomes much lower as well. So let me give you a familiar example with a very common symptom. A 55-year-old man 
gets brought in by ambulance to the emergency department because he has crushing chest pain. This man smokes two packs of cigarettes per day, has high cholesterol, is high blood pressure, is diabetic, and has a strong family history of heart disease with his father and grandfather dying of heart attacks. I think everyone can understand the likelihood of him having heart disease is quite high to explain his symptom. So if we do a reasonably good test to determine if he has heart disease and it comes back positive, I think the case is closed. Take the same scenario of chest pain, though, in a 25-year-old woman who runs five miles a day, has none of the risk factors that this gentleman had, and she comes into an office and says, I've been having an uncomfortable chest pain. Well, if we did a test looking for heart disease in her and the test came out positive, because the likelihood of heart disease in her population is so low, that test would probably be a false positive result. And the only thing we would have done is make her anxious and had to do another test to try to refute the finding of the first test. So let's go back to the uh, serology test for coronavirus infection. You might be interested to know that if the test we would choose had a maximal sensitivity and specificity of 99% and the prevalence of the virus in our population was more than double what I've thought about, let's say it was over 10%, the positive predictive value would be 67%. That means that two out of every three positive test results actually were true, that the person had antibodies for coronavirus. One out of three would be a false positive. Now let's get down to a more realistic prevalence level, 5%. At 5%, the positive predictive value was 49%. In other words, it's a 50-50 coin toss. If it's a positive result, does it mean it's really positive, or is it a false positive? If you get closer to what I think the truth might be in Vermont, two or three percent coronavirus in the population, the positive predictive value is 27%, which means essentially three out of every four people who get a positive result on the antibody test, that's a false positive result. I'm giving you this long-winded discussion just to show why we're choosing not to embark on testing the whole state of Vermont right now, just because we have tests that are available that have improved in their accuracy. And if similarly, if you ask your doctor for any test for any kind of disease, that's the thought process you want your doctor to be going through and that you should start to go through yourself as well. And if you would like to ask your doctor for a serology test for coronavirus, they are available and the doctor can, oper can, uh, can uh, order one, but just keep in mind um, how to interpret the result that comes back based on what we believe is a very low prevalence of virus in the population. Besides an analyzing the um, test platforms we have available, what else did the serology working group uh, recommend to us? Well, first, and in consideration of what I presented thus far, they are not advocating that these tests be used as a proof of immunity, nor evidence that an individual can or should return to work, not even to know truly if a person can get infected again. The work group recommended that we discourage the use of these tests in decisions about infection control or clinical care of individual Vermonters. And in this respect, they're actually echoing national guidance. Second, the work group left open the question of doing population level screening for antibodies for COVID-19 infection, but stated its role is limited and should be part of an epidemiological study that's conducted or planned by the CDC or the NIH or another academic organization. Many of these such studies are either just being launched or not even yet underway, but we are clearly open to exploring such studies with investigators both nationally and regionally. Thank you. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. Helen? 
All right, thank you. So, um, presenting data on the Winooski cluster today, as we see the cases are going down, which is a good thing, but in other parts of the country, I believe Austin, um, case rates are, are still rising, and state leaders and local officials are having to make hard choices of shutting down businesses. So, as we reopen up our economy, we'll, as you said, we'll see more cases. What would the data need to look like for us, and how many cases would we need to have for us to start shutting down businesses again? Well, I think uh, I'll let Dr. Levine comment on this, but uh, when we see that it's becoming an issue for our healthcare system, first of all, uh, it starts to exceed our capacity, uh, then we'll have to take action. When we see uh, these outbreaks throughout, mm -hmm. geographically throughout uh, Vermont, uh, with, a, uh, with a rate that's uh, concerning to us, then we would have to take action. Uh, but we feel as though uh, until there's a vaccine, we're going to have to deal with some outbreaks. It's just the reality uh, of the future until the vaccine uh, comes about. So we'll, uh, that's why we built up our testing and tracing capacity so we could deal with things like this. Uh, Winooski has given us an opportunity to test that out and to, to build upon that so that we can get better. Uh, in the future, but it may be a reality until, again, the vaccine is uh, is put on the market. And very little to add except that I would estimate over 50 percent of the tests we're doing every day are still outside of Chittenden County, and they're throughout the state, and we're just not finding lots of uh, disease in other sectors of the state. Um, I'm trying to be very cautious as I talk about Winooski because the numbers are looking so good uh, and the trend is looking so good, but you know, it does take time to play out. But clearly, a boxed in strategy is having an impact, uh, which is not playing out in some of the places around the country that you've mentioned and that they're concerned about. Um, and clearly, you know, we, we get asked the question all the time. Did this outbreak that's in Chittenden County occur because of the reopening process? And really, nothing could be farther from the truth. And I think we would see that all through the state if that were true. Many of the states like Texas, Arizona, Florida are very concerned um, about their rate of increase and their use of hospital resources and wondering about the fact that um, they may have to slow down things significantly. And then just a quick second question. Um, Long-term care facilities, um, when can we expect some sort of guidance on that, what will it look like? Because I know we've already heard from at least several facilities in Chittenden County which are kind of taking it into their own hands and letting visitation. I think I'll see you on Wednesday again here. And uh, that's when we have some news about that, those facilities. Thank you. And Commissioner Pichak, I know you're on the line. Maybe you could just uh, quickly uh, file off for Calvin, remind him of the reopening metrics we're watching as far as his first question on thresholds. Yeah, of course, I'd be happy to. So I think as we updated on Friday, you know, we have four metrics that we update every week, syndromic surveillance, uh, the growth rate of the virus, the percent of tests that are positive, and then the ICU capacity. And um, all of those have certain thresholds that are associated with them. And even during the outbreak, uh, each one of those metrics remained low, which was a good thing to see. And, uh, certainly, even the growth rate will be, um, you know, based on this weekend's uh, information, will continue to trend down as well. So those are the four metrics that, um, you know, are statewide and broad that we uh, are attending to look at during the reopening. All right, Stuart. Thank you, Governor. Uh, could you address the weekend vandalism outside? I, I know you issued a written statement on this, and some of the blowback that you're getting on your social media accounts that some of which uh, take you to task for uh, Black Lives Matter rather than All Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, you know, this weekend's activities, uh, disappointing, disturbing, concerning, all the above, uh, and it just proves uh, that we have a lot of work to do. And it proves uh, that we're we have to address this now and take the opportunity to do so. In, in terms of you know, s selecting the Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter, you know, I've heard a lot of analogies, but the one that rings true to me uh, is when after 9-11, for instance, um, we all rallied to, to the cause. Uh, this was a, an attack on us as Americans, attack on New York. 
uh, our way of life. Uh, so we rallied behind that. In Boston, uh, after the bombing, we, um, we rallied behind Boston, Boston strong, because it was the time to do that. We wanted to give our support uh, because they, they, they were after us, coming after us, coming after Boston, but coming after us as well. We should look at this the same way. Um, this has been an attack on black lives for far too long. And we need to address it now in this moment uh, and take this opportunity to do so. Take action. Uh, and of course, all lives matter, but black lives matter right now. And we need to address it. I guess to follow up on Stuart's comment, uh, some of the, taking the 9-11, for instance, or even the Boston bombing, that they were saying, we didn't see anything about Muslim lives matter. Uh, when there was attacks on Muslims when that occurred. And, you know, there, there are several other examples of that that they're saying, uh, you know, why did the city allow that, but they didn't allow the bikers to come through and do their usual toy run and all those kinds of things. You know, when we, when we saw um, the Jewish faith being attacked not too long ago, a lot of graffiti, uh, anti-Semitic, um, to overtones in, in some of the graffiti in Burlington. We came to their defense, uh, and we, we, we put out statements. We all rallied against that. Uh, so again, when, when this occurs, uh, we have to take action. And, and, and again, if, if something arises where, uh, against a minority group of any sort, we should rally to the cause. But right now, it's black lives. All right, moving to the phone, Sean at the Chester Telegraph. Thank you. Um, this is for uh, Secretary French. Uh, the K-12 schools at this point are either closed or closing for the year, and, and they're starting their in-service days or, or about to for training and planning for the fall. What's the timeline for the AOE to release more guidance and the uh, the district level planning template that um, was referred to in the June uh, 4th update on reopening. Secretary French. Morning, Scott. Yeah, good morning, Scott. Uh, thank you, Governor. Um, yeah, we'll have guidance out this week uh, around the public health parameters for reopening school. Um, we've also signaled the school district, typically, the issues based on service days. And there also could be uh, a, lot, a lot of attention on those days uh, spent on uh, improving continuity of learning, remote learning, which will be necessary in the fall as well. So, you know, we appreciate the timing isn't the best, but uh, it's also important that we, uh, you know, go with the latest public health information and uh, take our time to ensure that that foundational health guidance is uh, really solid. Thank you. Kat, WCAS. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Levine, one of the reasons uh, you listed for not doing antibody tests is that we think the virus rate here has been under 5% and that we would see a lot of false positives. How does what we're seeing in Winooski with the high amount of asymptomatic people play into that? Because if only 17% of people in Winooski are reporting symptoms but do have this virus, couldn't theoretically the number of Vermonters who've been exposed to the virus over the past few months and not known it be a lot higher than we think it is? And in which case, wouldn't the rate of correct positives for antibody tests ultimately be higher? It's a great question, and uh, you framed it very well. I think one thing about Winooski that we need to keep in mind is that 40% are kids, and um, that may explain a lot of the asymptomatic nature. Uh, even if those kids acquired the virus from adults, uh, they're much less prone to show symptoms. I think the other part is to look at what we've been doing with our PCR testing, you know, looking for active disease. We're, we're really, I have to say, looking at every nook and cranny that we can for people who might have uh, experienced COVID-19 and might have an asymptomatic infection, uh, and done that even in high-risk populations. So we've looked, you know, at the residents and staff and nursing home facilities and correctional facilities, looked at healthcare workers. We have um, allowed asymptomatic Vermonters for quite some time to get tested at a pop-up site of their choice. 
And we're just not finding um, a lot of people who may have the virus and even if they don't have symptoms, test positive on that modality. So it kind of reinforces my thought that I don't think we're going to find that many people with positive serology. And then when I look at the experience of um, a couple of other states that have done some surveys at this point in time, they're not finding high rates um, in their populations, even in places where they've had far greater disease activity over this time period. You know, the higher rates uh, on the serology testing would be uh, in the 10 percent range in places where they already knew that there was a lot of disease that was active uh, over time, like New York City. So um, I, I realize you could interpret this as almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, if you think there's low disease, um, why test so you'll never find out if there's higher disease? But I think it is part of real um, testing knowledge and, and protocol and based on the experiences nationwide and worldwide. I don't have a reason to think that Vermont suddenly would have adults with a larger amount of uh, experience than we've stated previously. Uh, two follow-ups then. Um, you said, you know, a lot of these community cases are kids and that might explain the level of, you know, not being highly symptomatic. Would serology tests then be useful for populations like children who where they might have gone unnoticed because they didn't really have symptoms? If you were, like, targeting a population to see if uh, there was sort of a hidden reservoir of people who had seen the virus, that, that might be a reasonable strategy. Um, I, it's, hard to, it's really hard to know uh, because, again, we don't think kids are spreading it that much amongst themselves or amongst adults. Uh, so um, that may still reflect a lower prevalence of disease even in the kid population. Um, we just don't know. You know, we, we've certainly done a lot more testing of children, forget about Winooski, just in the prior time, because uh, we allowed that to happen, uh, where it had been more restrictive earlier on in our experience. And we aren't finding, you know, high rates in, in the children that have been tested outside of the outbreak. And my last follow-up related to Winooski is, you know, I heard you mention that the number of contacts still remains about the same as the number of cases. What does that tell us about how that virus spread within the population that um, was interconnected? It means like almost everybody got it? Well, no. So, so in this case, if you're identified as a contact, you had sufficient um, connection to the case to be at higher risk of becoming infected. Uh, whether that be because of your know, living circumstances, the amount of time you spent with the person, the intensity of one-to-one -one contact with the person. So that doesn't mean you're going to become a case. But it turns out thus far, and it's still early in the game, approximately one in seven of those contacts, and that's a rough estimate, um, um, have become cases. So. There are plenty of people who would still be listed as contacts because of their risk need to be in quarantine, but may never actually show a positive test or a symptom. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, The Islander. Good morning. Uh, this is for Suzanne Young. I, I know we didn't connect on Friday, but you had a question to me as to which office building was not flagging people with masks. Uh, it's the Ace of Bloomer State Office Building on Merchant Row in downtown Rutland. They're not asking questions, not taking temperatures, no nothing. Uh, and I believe there are signs telling people to wear masks, I'm told. But people walk right by and the building is used to uh, as a cut through to the bus station. So uh, I guess the question we can follow up later, but uh, some of the visitors and clients are in vulnerable groups and they're wandering through the building. So disabilities and aging, Department of Children for Children and Families, the Health Department, Labor Department, BSAC are all among those in the building. So there's quite a bit of foot traffic uh, and some of the people are working at home. But 
I know we didn't connect, but maybe you can follow up with me later on that one. As far as the question for today, unless you have an answer. Thanks. No, but thank you for that information, Mike. Yep. Uh, a couple questions that popped up over the weekend and today. Uh, frustrated Vermonters are wondering when the legislature is going to go home for the year. A couple of business owners are upset that the legislature has failed to deliver all the COVID funds for their starving and needy businesses and for Vermonters. And at least one email I wanted to know why the legislature is still in overtime considering even non-COVID related emergency items at this point and one reader asked specifically are taxpayers still paying for legislators hotels condos rentals meals other expenses if they're not if they haven't been in Montpelier for the last three months are the, are the taxpayers still putting any or all expenses there and what is the daily or weekly price tax of Vermonters on that um, and I realize you may not know that yeah. number today so if you want to get back to me Wednesday, that's fine too. But I, I think those are more appropriate uh, for the legislat legislators as, um, as a whole, maybe with the, um, the speaker and the, and the pro tem. Uh, the fact is, uh, when we received the $1.25 billion, um, I had a choice to make. Uh, other states had, had contemplated just uh, the governor would have control uh, of the resource of the money. And I just thought it was a better approach uh, to work together with the legislature. So the reality is we need them, and we need them uh, to stay until we disperse the money. And uh, these are difficult times. You know, we, uh, we certainly uh, didn't come at an appropriate time for anyone, uh, but not the legislature in particular, uh, because we were right in the middle of our legislative session uh, in trying to get a budget out, trying to get the, uh, uh, the budget adjustment from last year out, uh, as well as next year's budget. So um, I know uh, they've been working on the, uh, the budget, uh, the, the uh, quarter uh, of a year budget uh, that uh, they're moving forward with. I did receive, I think, uh, about 12 or 13 bills on Friday uh, that uh, some of them are COVID related. So we appreciate that. And, uh, and I've signed uh, most of them today and we have a couple more uh, coming, I believe. So. You know, they're, they're trying to finish up their work. I'm not sure when they're going to uh, go into recess. I think they're, whenever they do, I think they're coming back. I know they're coming back in August or September uh, so that we can determine at that point uh, how we budget for the rest of the year. Uh, we're doing it for the first three months uh, right now uh, and then uh, come back and determine how we deal with the rest of it. So. Um, they're essential partners, uh, separate branch, and uh, and we need them uh, to uh, to work with us uh, to get uh, get through this. But I guess the question is, they could be focused. It appears uh, from the readers that they could be focused on COVID-19. They seem to be doing other issues, and they are in fact going to have to come back again. So apparently, people are surprised that, especially during an election year, when they usually try to get out of Montpelier early, that they haven't left and knowing that they've got to come back and do the other three quarters budget uh, at some point too. Yeah, unusual times for sure. Um, but those are probably yeah. more appropriate uh, questions for them. But at some point, can you get a dollar amount to uh, what the state is paying? I mean, I assume uh, the treasurer or somebody has to pay these, these funds. Um, yeah, I can, I can at least point you in the right direction. Okay, thank you, yes. fair enough. Thank you, Governor, we can follow up on that. Thank you, Secretary Young. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. Can you explain what the extension of state of emergency means for the average Vermonter and what things need to look like before uh, before you were willing to let that state of emergency? Yeah, it, you know, it is tough to, uh, to realize, and we've done a lot uh, since I declared the state of emergency back in, in March, March 13th. And uh, it really is just a, a vehicle, if you can, if you can relate to that. Uh, something that, uh, or a mechanism where we get to uh, put all kinds of restrictions in place, which we did, 
yeah, as I said uh, in my opening remarks, we close uh, schools, we close a lot of businesses, put restrictions on everything, a stay home, stay safe order was part of that as well. Um, but, but that same framework uh, is needed, that mechanism is needed to unwind all that as well so that we do it in a measured way. So um, we've, uh, we've already opened up uh, some, almost every sector to some degree. Um, like today, uh, we're opening up, uh, open up campgrounds uh, to 100%, from 50% to 100%. Um, so that's the way we have to do it. We need something. Uh, to open things up in a measured, responsible way and to make sure that we don't have any outbreaks and spikes and so forth as we do this. So if uh, all of a sudden we saw a number of outbreaks throughout the, the state that gave us concern, uh, we would slow things down. Or if we didn't see anything and, and the region was getting better in Boston and, and uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut and, and lower New Hampshire and Maine and so forth were getting better, uh, we might open things up a little bit faster. So it's just a way to do that and to manage it. Okay, great. And then Rita reached out to us again, and they're wondering why people are allowed to rally um, and hold these uh, gatherings, uh, yeah, such as Black Lives Matter, it's, uh, and they're not practicing social distancing. They're just wondering why those individuals are, are allowed to do that. Yeah, again, it, you know, I think the uh, First Amendment right uh, trumps some of the, the other responses, and we are just asking them, we don't want to go out and, and arrest everyone and, and, and cause uh, more disruption, uh, but we are asking them uh, to wear masks, try and social distance as much as possible. And for the most part, I'm seeing that, uh, and I was, uh, I'm grateful uh, as I watch uh, some of the protests and some of the, uh, the, the media um, photographs and so forth of some of these these uh, these protests uh, that they are wearing masks and I think that that's a testament to, to them understanding the the uh, gravity of the situation uh, but also wanting to exercise their First Amendment rights uh, and to take it, it's you know again for this to happen at the same time inconvenient uh, at best but uh, but again I think this is too important of an issue uh, to let go Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. This question is for Secretary Curley, and it's about um, fitness and fitness studios reopening. I was able to find on the ACCD website some guidelines for non-cardiovascular classes. I'm wondering if there are guidelines that have been issued for classes that very specifically raise people's heart rates and require them to move around the room, something like high-intensity interval training, or even a class like spinning, where people are in a fixed location, but the goal is to breathe very hard. Are there guidelines for that yet? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, that is a great question. We have um, indoor close contact. Uh, I'm, I'm just sorry, I'm trying to find it right now. Um, I might be able to answer part of that while you're looking yeah. for it, Secretary okay. Curley. Uh, I believe, Lisa, uh, they have been opened up. Um, the, the gathering size uh, is limited, uh, obviously, uh, and you have to maintain a physical separation. A lot of regulations around cleaning the equipment and hygiene and so forth uh, goes along with that. But, uh, but I would say spinning classes, uh, some of that interval uh, training, um, CrossFit and so forth, uh, is allowed to happen, uh, but in a much, much different way than before. Uh, limited in size, uh, capacity, as well as uh, making sure uh, they maintain that uh, distancing and uh, cleaning equipment uh, is so necessary in between intervals and between people. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, so mm -hmm. Just to be clear, it's, um, it's Section 8.1 close contact business, stage two. And uh, again, you know, there's clear guidelines about separating people out, and, you know, it's hard to exercise with a mask on, but there may be times where masks are needed in the areas to get to get the equipment and whatnot, but um, it is outlined in there. 25 percent occupancy. Okay, just to follow up though, the six foot distance requirement is for um, non cardiovascular fixed position fitness classes. Is there a is there a bigger distance people should be separated for for high intensity aerobic activity in a, in a studio situation? 
So, uh, are you finding that on our website that we're that clear about the... The, the I didn't find anything. Of, yeah, I, I did not find anything specific. But what I found on the website is specific references to the types of classes that fitness classes that can take place. Okay. Um, so my apologies on this. There's a lot of information out there. Um, if, if you're okay with it, I'd love to take it offline. We'll get you some some uh, guidance on what you're asking about specifically. Um, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello, Governor. Um, I'm not sure who this question would be for. Um, I know looking back at things, um, it's easy to see um, errors or things that you didn't know in the past. But I'm curious, I asked this before um, a while ago, um, in preparing hospitals to accept the expected uh, load of COVID patients, um, a lot of um, more normal activities were put on hold. And I'm wondering whether there's any sense at this point whether those actions resulted in excess deaths. Um, just due to the fact that people didn't get treatment that they ordinarily would have had. Yeah, I think uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Levine answer this, but it uh, has been a concern of ours uh, because we know that people weren't going uh, to their appointments, uh, weren't coming in uh, because they're afraid of, uh, of COVID-19 uh, and not getting checked out when they should. But I don't know uh, whether there was any increase in the death rate as a result. My impression is that there was no increase in the death rate. This is early information, though, because you have to remember the governor just went over the timeline. Uh, things happened relatively quickly here. So we may not have complete information to analyze yet with regard to that. That question's being asked everywhere uh, around the country, around the world. And there are some clear places where there were surges and it's quite evident that death rates were higher, mostly due to COVID probably and not to other conditions. Um, we know that the rate of people presenting with some of these other conditions to hospitals was lower, but that doesn't necessarily mean people were dying of them more often. Um, so at the moment, I'm gonna answer your question saying we don't think that the death rate increased due to these other conditions, but we will be analyzing that data over time, and I will certainly try to bring that back to one of these press conferences uh, with more definitive answer for you. So is it reasonable to assume that had there been a substantial increase, that would have been spotted much sooner? Well, for sure, especially in a state that uh, thank goodness was spared that many COVID deaths. Um, so with that rate being so low, uh, clearly um, I, I think it would have been a, quite evident. Thank you very much. Greg, the County Courier. Good morning, Governor. Um, from what I can tell, there are about 11 states that are pursuing contact tracing applications for phones uh, with the intent that they'd be used voluntarily. Has Vermont considered the use of uh, such apps within our, our response to COVID? I, I believe yes is the, the answer. I mean, we're using Sarah Alert, um, but uh, we've also contemplated other methods as well. <laughs> I don't know, Dr. Levine, you want to answer further on this? Sarah Alert is the main one. Yeah, Sarah Alert's the, the main one that we've been dealing with at this point, but we are, you know, looking at other uh, apps and other um, forums to do just what you're saying. It's, it's not a... And, and Sarah Alert would, uh, would actually be able to track 
the public and, and be able to determine if they've had contact with someone yeah, that no, also that, has this app, is that my understanding? Yeah, that's, that would be a different, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it was Google or, or one of the other ones, but uh, that's a different type of app. I'll let Dr. Levine answer uh, so you can get an idea of what Sarah Alert is. Yes, the Sarah Alert is really a communication tool, bi-directional, so a health department can push out information to the person who's uh, been contacted and also inform them of the kinds of symptoms to uh, report, etc. And the person can feedback information uh, from their direction. Uh, it is not a tracking tool. Uh, there are some apps uh, Google and Apple that uh, will do that, and that uh, we've actually talked about here, but uh, we've not actually embarked on that journey. Um, so currently, if a Vermonter has been contacted by someone in the health department and uh, given instructions regarding isolation or quarantine or their degree of risk based on uh, a, a person who tested positive, um, they are getting lots of information and guidance and able to do the same in reverse, but they're not being tracked in terms of their movements. Um, so you said that you guys have considered the uh, Apple applications, for example. What kind of uh, discussions has been taking place about uh, personal privacy and, and the pros and cons of of having that right. uh, as part of your right. that, 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 that is indeed the reason why it's been talk and no action, uh, because that's a concern, obviously, of any Vermonter and across the country, for that matter. There are nations that are using these um, routinely, uh, but their societies are, um, have bought into that, and that's part of uh, their culture that um, is happening without much discussion. In, in Vermont, clearly, we have sufficient concerns about privacy and infringing on people's own personal rights that we have not uh, taken that pathway. Doesn't mean, though, that we don't explore some of these possibilities and, and discuss them, but clearly, we have not acted on any of those. Okay, so are you guys still considering that kind of thing, even even like a voluntary uh, usage? I can't say that that's true at this point in time. I mean, perhaps in the future we could, but at this point in time, that's not where we've gone. No. Okay. Thank you. Wilson, the AP. Hi, good morning everybody, as always, thanks for making yourself so available. Um, I have two questions, one for Dr. Levine and one for Mike Kuchuk, I guess. I can ask them both to begin. Um, Dr. Levine, you talked a lot about the Wojcicki outbreak. Do you now consider that to be in the past tense, something that has passed uh, and finished, and now you're take, learning the lessons from it as we all go forward? It is definitely not in the past tense. It is something we are still um, watching day to day. Um, it's way too early knowing the uh, incubation period of virus um, and the number of people who were involved to uh, just put a check mark and move on. Uh, we really do need to keep ongoing surveillance and working with that population. So um, we are discussing lessons learned all the time. Um, and, and that's, I think, very important for us to do as a government and as a health department. But clearly, I don't put it in the past tense yet. That's why I was very cautious in my original presentation today to uh, not just say that the weekend looks so good, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, test results. Um, and that's why we're testing in both Burlington and Winooski each day this week. Okay, perfect, thank you. And then my second question, um, Mike, are you or, or whomever is collecting those statistics, are you looking at what's going on in Canada? Uh, I don't know if Quebec or Canada, for that matter, collects this data in the equivalent of counties or not. 
but at some point the border will open and then uh, would, would you have the uh, make it possible for people from Canadian counties if, again if that's the correct terminology to come here once the border reopens yeah so we have been tracking um, data from Canada mostly from the Quebec province uh, we will um, Largely, Canada has been reporting their data at the Providence or territory level. Uh, so we've been uh, trying to find ways to get good data at a more granular level so we can have a, uh, potentially have something set up like we do with the uh, current um, you know, regional travel program. So it's certainly something that we're looking at and uh, hope to have um, the data that we need and, and the analysis done that we would need uh, when the border is ready to be open. Okay, perfect. Thank you both. Guy Page. Governor, could you or Commissioner Sherling please answer this question I asked on Friday? Uh, can you assure Vermonters that if protesters try to establish a police free autonomous zone in Vermont for Capitol Hill in Seattle, that you will stop it promptly and definitively? And if so, how? Um. Guy, uh, first of all, I did uh, take a look over the weekend at the situation in Seattle, and it certainly is uh, bizarre in, in many ways. Um, I, I don't uh, have any information uh, about uh, uh, this initiative here in Vermont, unless unless you have uh, knowledge or you heard uh, that there's going to be something of, of that uh, magnitude here in Vermont, and if you do, I'd ask you to call the public safety and report it to them so we can continue to track. But to my knowledge, uh, there is nothing uh, that is uh, is heading our way uh, that we know of. Um, Commissioner Sherling, anything to add to that? Uh, no, thank you, Governor. Um, I think uh, you know Vermonters uh, conduct themselves um, in protests and demonstrations in uh, an often a, a different but similar, but impactful way, and uh, you know we we trust that that track record is going to continue. Thank you. Uh, my second question: As the chief executive sworn to uphold the Vermont Constitution, do you think the Ascutney School Board is stifling free speech by threatening the Windsor School principal with a loss of her job for expressing skepticism about some of the BLM tactics? Yeah, it sounds like a, uh, a constitutional question uh, that is uh, appropriately uh, is appropriate to ask. Uh, I, I would imagine. I don't. I haven't. Again, I know of the situation, uh, but I don't know what has tra transpired since. Uh, whether the uh, the principal uh, herself is being uh, is uh, is has obtained a lawyer and is using uh, that for a basis, but. And I, I do, uh, I do, uh, you know, question a bit uh, when when you have someone uh, that is expressing uh, their right uh, to free speech um, to be um, to be penalized for that in, in that manner. Uh, I think is uh, problematic. But I'll let I'll let I, I'm assuming that this is going to be uh, some sort of legal battle, but probably left to someone who is a constitutional expert. Okay. Thank you very much. Andrew, Caledonia Record. Yes, thank you. Uh, Governor, good afternoon. Um, we heard of a local resident that was riding with his family this weekend on Kingdom Trail uh, when they came across a rider who had fallen and was unconscious um, while rendering aid and calling 911. The um, Good Samaritan learned the injured rider was from Boston up for a day trip with at least one other. Uh, I'm wondering if the state learns of situations like this in which an individual has um, almost assuredly violated the quarantine requirements, is there any disciplinary action that the state can take? Um, and is there any expectation for hospital workers or first responders to report known violations? Yeah, that is uh, concerning and uh, not surprising in some respects. I think I alluded to this uh, last week that we know uh, some are not taking our guidance seriously and are coming uh, from some of those affected communities, which again is concerning uh, for everyone involved. Um, uh, I, maybe I'd refer to Commissioner Sherling. Uh, I'm not sure that there's anything uh, that, uh, that we have uh, in place uh, for any type of uh, 
um, violation that we can issue. Commissioner Sherling, are you aware of anything? No, you're correct, Governor. I think uh, we would be interested to know so that we can follow up with uh, additional uh, education. And if uh, we see trends emerging, we can adjust our messaging, uh, in particular to uh, populations that, that may be uh, inbound to Vermont to ensure that they're aware uh, of our quarantine requirement. As I'm reflecting on this, as much as we you know, love to have our our uh, surrounding states come to visit us uh, if they're from the Boston area and certainly uh, the area that we're concerned about. Um, we, and we see continue, continue to see a, a prevalence of that. Uh, we may have to impose some sort of restriction or ask uh, some of these entities uh, to find out where they came from. And if they came from a, a, a county that is not on the list, uh, that they uh, may have to refuse entry. But it's not something we've uh, we've um, put into place at this point, uh, but if we continue to see uh, a, a violation of this, uh, of, of the executive order, uh, then we may have to take other actions. I'm wondering, um, as a follow-up, if, if there are any provisions in mind for when college kids start coming back to the state, and um, not that I want to say, you know, 20-somethings are going to be more prone to violating executive orders, and, staying inside, but how that, how that might play out and, and what, um, what could be developed to yeah. ensure compliance. Yeah, we, we, have, um, we have contemplated that. In fact, uh, some have already started arriving in the Chittenden County area, and we put out guidance in, in accordance to that. Um, maybe Secretary, um, yeah, maybe Secretary Curley would be the best to answer that. Maybe uh, find the guidance, or Commissioner Sherling, one of the two. I know uh, you were uh, part of the discussion as well, and when we were discussing having people move in uh, in the Chittenden County area. Yeah, Governor, can you just repeat the question? It was about uh, you know as we welcome back uh, college students uh, and what uh, what guidance we're giving them as they arrive back in Vermont. And if there's a mechanism for ensuring compliance. Yes. Okay. Yeah, there, there is a quarantine policy in place. And um, I would have to find it on the website for you, but um, it gives uh, the students can, can quarantine at home before they come. They can, uh, you know, quarantine 14 days or they can quarantine for seven days, obtain a test, and then come with a negative test. Or they can come to Vermont and there's an opportunity to, to quarantine here. And I know that they were working with the colleges and the universities. They have a plan on how they can obtain testing. And again, I can't put my fingers on it right at the moment, but there's definitely a plan um, and it's laid out. And uh, again, you know, maybe Commissioner Sherling or Dr. Levine have a little bit more on that off the top of their head. Yeah, and I'm happy to follow up this. If it's still hanging. Yeah, the vast majority of the students are, are contemplating uh, coming in another month or so, um, maybe longer. And we are working with the colleges and universities with their plan uh, in working together on how to uh, uh, how to uh, uh, um, encourage that and uh, make sure that there's compliance. But I don't think uh, we've we've uh, come to any conclusion. But we are working with them under the guidance of uh, Rich Schneider, uh, former president of Norwich University, who is leading the charge, so to speak. Uh, Mr. Sherling, anything to add to that? Uh, just a, a bit, Governor, that uh, in anticipation of the, the one of the busy move dates, which was June 1st, there was messaging that went out from the colleges, from the state, uh, from landlords. We worked together uh, on ensuring that folks were aware uh, of the, the quarantine requirements and how to move uh, uh, do their moves safely um, and then I think what we heard from uh, the, the municipalities who uh, host uh, a disproportionate number of students where the things went reasonably well they had, uh, they had good compliance with the health guidance that's been issued and we're hoping uh, for the same thing in uh, late August early September when we see that that second set of moves occur. Great. Thank you for your time. All right, Avery, WCAX. 
My question is likely for Secretary French. So uh, we spoke with the Vermont NEA who expressed some concern about the reopening of schools and just um, all the different issues that could arise. How are you all working with them um, and teachers to kind of come up with these solutions like internet connectivity and um, just kind of those like technology gaps? Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, we're working closely with Vermont NEA and other uh, education associations in the state, uh, particularly on the health guidance, as I mentioned earlier, which will be coming out this week. Um, but yeah, there'll be there'll be a lot of uh, concerns to address. I think, you know, once again, uh, the health guidance is sort of the foundation of uh, the guidance that we'll be promulgating uh, since this district's in the reopening. Um, but there are active players and been active participants in the development of that guidance, as have been others. Um, I think once the health guidance is done, we do envision the need to do a broader uh, communi community and communications outreach. So we're expecting, I think, to uh, or create a better process to uh, get parent uh, input in particular. Um, but I think, you know, for now, I'm, I'm very pleased with the level of participation by the groups, and they've certainly uh, contributed significantly to the development of the guidance that we'll be putting out this week. Thank you. Colin, BT Digger. Yeah, hey, good morning, uh, afternoon, I guess. Um, I have a question for the governor. Uh, as the state of emergency continues, I'm wondering how long you plan to continue holding uh, three times a week press conferences. Um, how long do you want us to? <laughs> Let's not leave it totally after that. <laughs> um, as long as we have information to give, um, and we'll leave it up to a lot of you. As long as you want us to continue, uh, we'll continue. Uh, but uh, but there is going to be a time when we look forward, as we look forward to that, uh, when we'll reduce the number of uh, press conferences in the week. But uh, but at this at this point, we still have a lot of information uh, to uh, disperse, and uh, it seems to be working. Uh, but if there's uh, a time when the when the press is not interested anymore. Uh, please let us know, and we'll uh, we'll reduce those numbers uh, dramatically uh, as a result. Um, and I know there seems to be an expectation at some point that things stay pretty narrowly focused on COVID-19. Obviously, with a lot of the racial justice thing in the past few weeks, you've sort of shifted topically based on the news of the day. I'm wondering, are these still COVID-19 press conferences, or? Are they sort of all encompassing now? How should we sort of think about that? Well, we, I've tried to be transparent and honest. When you ask a question, I would rather uh, talk about just COVID. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, this is uh, topical and, and important to have these discussions about racial uh, injustice and what we're seeing across the country and in Vermont. And we need to, uh, we need to answer those questions. Uh, but um, but it, again, uh, I just tried to answer the questions we could uh, limit those uh, and uh, and just talk about COVID if that's uh, if that's what you'd like to do. Uh, but I would ask uh, if if that's what you'd like uh, to not ask any of the other questions. I was calling to or asking about your sort of uh, plans about this. Um, obviously, as far as BG Digger's position, I'd have to consult with others. Um, and, yeah, I, I guess those are most of my questions. Um, as far as press conferences about other things, say more political type of stuff, um, as was once the case once a week, have you considered perhaps reopening a time where the press can ask you about things that aren't COVID-19? I'll have to confer with my people and uh, we'll get back to you. All righty. All set, Colin? Uh, John, VPR. Thank you. Um, I don't think I need to confer with anybody because this one <laughs> is uh, it, it, It's a question about the Air Alert app. Um, we, we got a query from an Airbnb owner who wondered how mandatory that is because she says um, her guests, some of them were not booked with her because of, you know, the, maybe the invasion aspect of the privacy concerns they had it but and then a, a larger lodging establishment um, has set up their own certification 
form and is not having their guests register with Sarah. So I wondered if what the state was doing to ensure consistency and how this is being enforced or if it's being enforced and what can you tell us in on or about? Yeah, Commissioner about Levine. That? Yeah, thanks for letting me clarify. Sarah Alert is, is not mandatory. Um, it is voluntary. It's actually meant to be helpful and to be considered by the user to be an aid for them uh, in terms of their knowledge acquisition about what's going on and their ability to communicate in a relatively simple, direct way, daily if desired, with, with the health department about their condition. So. Um, the, the only issue is really making sure that somebody who's coming into the state and perhaps choosing to quarantine uh, at a lodging facility um, connect with the health department. Um, and that, of course, would enable them to also be able to uh, access the day seven testing um, if they're completely asymptomatic during that time period. And then when the result comes back, the release from quarantine. And Sarah Alert would certainly help them understand all of that as well. So again, it's, it's meant to be helpful. It's not mandatory. Uh, and the health department's eager to talk with any and all people who are finding themselves in the position where they need to be in a quarantine situation. OK, thanks. And, and you, you touched on this earlier, Dr. Levine, but is are you saying when Wilson asked you about Winiski that um, it's not contained, um, but you're you're encouraged by what you're seeing there? Is, is that the underlying point about the Winiski Burlington outbreak that it, it may not be contained, but you like you like what you're seeing? Uh, I'll try to rephrase that for you. I do like what I'm okay. seeing. I don't want to be overly enthusiastic about what I'm seeing this early because we're really having just the weekend as our data point for saying things are looking much better and there's no increase in activity and it's stable. Um, we do think we are actually doing a nice job with containment, but I would like to see the results of the targeted testing this week where people have the opportunity to walk in to, with an appointment to get tested in Burlington or Winooski before I uh, put closure to the uh, outbreak, if you will. Uh, but certainly all the data I've shown you this morning and talked about gives me reason for great uh, hopefulness regarding um, that outbreak. Great. Thank you very much. Maria, Washington Post. Thank you again for holding these really informative press conferences. I'm um, sorry if I missed it, but is there any update on the USCIS furloughs? Have you gotten any numbers or information about when it might happen? Yeah, I, I don't have anything at this point. Uh, I think Commissioner Harrington uh, looked into it uh, as well. Commissioner, do you have any updates? Uh, yeah, thank you, Governor. We, um, we did speak with the contractor um, specifically, but um, and it doesn't seem there's any indication with those that are under contract working for USCIS. Um, that being said, there have been indications in the news across the country about um, possible furloughs across USCIS. Uh, and we do have a request in, a formal request into USCIS specifically about their government agents and whether or not Vermont would um, be impacted and if so, to what extent. Um, and I believe that went in uh, last week. So we have not heard anything back in terms of um, what that actually means in terms of, of people who uh, work for the federal government through USCIS at this time. This time. All right, thank, thank you very much. Um, I just one quick um, follow-up for Dr. Levine. Dr. Levine, at the last press conference, you mentioned um, that you did not think when you see was a sign of a, the second wave, that that's not what you thought uh, the second wave would look like. And, I'm curious about what you do think a second wave would look up like and whether Vermont actually might not experience one given your number. Sure, thank you. Um, to me, a second wave would look like a more sustained peak um, and more prevalence across the broader Vermont population. Um, I wouldn't think it would just 
spark in one, one particular place. We have a pretty small state and uh, interconnected state. Um, so I, you know, it, it, it's really hard to even ask me what I would think uh, the sort of resurgence or second wave would look like because when you ask national experts, they'll give you diagrams that are all over the place. Um, but clearly, um, if you look at what our experience was in the so-called first wave, it was way more prominent and um, concerning. Uh, and that was at a time when we couldn't really do containment for all the reasons we've, we've stated many times uh, in Vermont or in the country. This time we could. Um, and I think a second wave would really be more sustained community transmission uh, across the broader community as opposed to within a number of households, things of that sort. So um, for many reasons, I don't see this particular outbreak as representing uh, that feared consequence. Thank you very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Uh, uh, the ski areas are starting to send out their um, uh, requests for ski passes and other bookings and things like that, and they're not as nimble a uh, hospitality uh, industry as like a single restaurant or a hotel or something like that. Uh, given the um, you know the level of infections we're seeing not only in the region but across the country and growing, in that case, what can you tell them about what their expectations might be? in, you know, another few months as far as your, you know, reopening. Yeah, yeah. D difficult. I mean, if uh, if things kept going the way they're going right now uh, without that second wave that uh, Dr. Levine was talking about just now, um, we would uh, be on the path uh, to being open almost normal uh, by the time that uh, late, late fall um, into uh, November, November uh, December. Um, but uh, hard for us to say uh, at this point. Uh, we're going to continue to open up uh, methodically here in the, in the state and try to get everything open, but just not understanding what's going to happen next and how that affects us and, and what happens in other states as well in some of those areas where we count on uh, tourism and, and those uh, who skiers uh, from some of the, from New York and, and Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Jersey and Rhode Island and so forth. So. We'll just have to wait and see. I can't give them anything definitive at this point in time, but um, we're encouraged by the numbers we're seeing today, and hopefully uh, we'll continue to move in the right direction, and, and there'll be a vaccine that will magically appear in the very near future. Uh, magic, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, um, I think we're all hoping for that. I'm just wondering if, if you would caution them to uh, pump the brakes a little bit on, on their booking. Well, sir, I, I would think that they, uh, they'd have to balance this, obviously, uh, not knowing. Uh, they, they have no, no way to determine the future either. Um, but, um, but as long as they put provisions uh, in place uh, where there's some, some caution to the wind, so to speak, um, I don't see any reason why they couldn't be selling uh, passes at this point. And you know they lost their profit margin. Really, you know they get they make a lot of their profits in that the March April range. It, it, was there any money targeted? I don't think there was for them for any relief. I know these are large national corporations, but was there any um, local assistance um, going toward them? Financial um, assistance? Yeah, not not that I'm aware of. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks, Governor. Aaron, VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, just confirming because I had a bit of a snap for the last time. Um, I, uh, I noticed this morning that the data site went from about 50 people being monitored, in, which has been kind of the range each day, to over 400. Um, I wanted to confirm that that is Correct. And also just ask, um, are these all types of risky outbreaks? Um, 
is there has there been like a significant change in the way the health department uh, monitors people or reports on that number because of the Winnipeg outbreak? Yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. I, I watched the numbers fairly closely, and and I hadn't seen that. Um, I don't know if Dr. Levine or Commissioner Pichek or anybody else has seen uh, that that spike. Uh, we'd be happy to take a look at it and, and uh, get back to you, Aaron. But not anything that has uh, risen to, to our attention. It's it's on. Okay. The, um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we've determined it's on the website, so we're not questioning that. We just want to uh, look into why. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Um, if you might, if you don't mind, uh, you know, my second question was like, has has the nature of how the health department does contact tracing and monitoring changed at all because of Winnipeg? Uh. I, you know, we, we continue to learn uh, every every day about what we can do uh, better. Uh, we went over that uh, this morning, uh, lessons learned, so to speak, and uh, we're always trying to enhance and, and grow and be better prepared in the future. So I would have to say we've learned, obviously, uh, but uh, I don't believe this is anything dramatic uh, that's going to change. Uh, we just are, are getting uh, better, more nimble, and uh, in growing the capacity. Dr. Levine? So just to be clear, the, the question was, what, what have we learned that we can do better? Uh, just specifically with contact tracing, has there been any changes because of the Winooski outbreak? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I'm really proud of uh, my epidemiology section and all of the people in that section, plus others we've drawn in from the, from the Greater Health Department to do contact tracing. Um, even before the Winooski outbreak, we actually had done a so-called table talk exercise looking at uh, how we would go about managing an outbreak, how we would uh, reach a certain capacity in terms of how big an outbreak could get before we would get very concerned that it had outstripped our capacity to uh, deal with it. and. Um, I have to say that we came away very confident after that exercise. And as Winooski has evolved, it's probably involved maybe a tenth of the capacity that we envisioned we might have in a very severe outbreak that would be statewide uh, with lots and lots of cases and needs to do contact tracing. The interesting thing that's happened is We've all come out of a stay home, stay safe order and try to begin opening up uh, everything in Vermont, including our own lives. And what that means is we actually are in contact with more people than ever before. Contact tracing was a piece of cake when people had their family members at home and there was really nobody else they were in contact with. And now uh, it's much more complex. Not quite, perhaps, for some people the way it was before COVID, but still in that continuum. Uh, so the contact tracing work actually is more complex than it ever was with numbers of people. And we're going back 14 days in people's experience, which is why, and I can remind Vermonters now, we've asked Vermonters to kind of be conscious of what they're doing on a daily basis, because if they become a positive test and we start to contact trace, they're going to need to remember a couple of weeks' worth of connectivity in their lives. Uh, so that's very complex. Uh, but it's all gone very well, I have to say. We'll always be able to do things better, and we're learning how to do that. But um, I have to keep people reminded that this isn't new work for a health department. It's a new virus. It's got new ramifications, but any time people had foodborne illnesses related to something they bought in a store or ate at a restaurant, any time we had prior epidemics of flu viruses or other things, contact tracing uh, is something, and in investigation of cases is something that is a pretty routine thing. So we need to be able to scale it up and we were happy that we could scale it up for this uh, episode and 
God forbid, if we need it for future episodes, uh, this has given us that confidence. Okay, thank you very much. Steve, NEK TV. Can you hear me? We can. Um, thank you. Um, uh, a couple for Dr. Levine and maybe a couple for the governor, if I may. How about one for uh, each? Dr. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds like a deal. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, earlier you said that uh, you thought, in the beginning of the conference, you said you thought the increase uh, of cases in the other states uh, could be due to their uh, reopening. Uh, couldn't they also be due to the uh, massive amounts of increased testing? I guess the nuanced answer is that's possibly a component. Um, although some of the states are actually reporting they're not able yet to do the testing that they want to be doing in terms of quantity. When we look at our metrics, we're, we've actually surpassed the uh, quantity we thought we would need for minimum surveillance testing in the population. Um, the, the concern in the other states is most of the testing they're doing is people who are actually symptomatic with disease, and that's why some of them are concerned about the utilization of their healthcare system. Uh, so it's a little different proposition, if you will, which uh, tells me that um, it's not just increasing testing, it's doing testing on people who actually are reporting symptoms of a condition and uh, finding them as a case. Uh, little less so testing general people in the population. Having said that, there are plenty of states that are actually doing abundant testing and similar to what we're doing and finding uh, low rates of test positivity across large populations. It's just that the states that have now been identified more recently are clearly having uh, a problem with illness in their states. I see. Thank you. Uh, Governor, um, this goes back to uh, a question I'd asked on Friday. Um, the 13th Amendment uh, outlaws slavery except for prisons. And I asked you about commuting the sentences um, for nonviolent drug offenders. Uh, a, a large portion which in, are in Vermont prisons uh, are, are people of color um, who, who, who may or may not be, you know, from Vermont. Uh, and in, when I asked about commutation, you tossed it to the legislature, which are leaving in a little while. Couldn't you just uh, get the data from your uh, corrections commissioner, look at these people who've had uh, nonviolent drug offenses, and not only free them, but uh, uh, not only free them, but you know, save the taxpayers of about fifty thousand per head a year. You know, um, Steve, we, we've reduced the offender population by about three or four hundred uh, already in the last three months um, by doing just what you're saying. Is uh, in some of those uh, situations, making sure that we release uh, those who are on the uh, on the uh, uh, lower. Um, How many? I have about 400, uh, you know, between three and 400 um, out of a population of about 16 or 1700 uh, to begin with. So we've reduced dramatically uh, over the last uh, three months. I think um, what we need to do, uh, to be quite honest, is uh, make sure we stay there. Uh, and, and then we can try and bring what I'd like to see is uh, bring the uh, offender population in uh, from out of state and get them here within our borders. But some of it is out of our control. I mean, there's, uh, uh, the, there is uh, the judiciary, uh, the judicial branch, as well as the legislative branch that makes the laws, uh, and, then, and then we have to adhere to them. So um, not all of it is up to us uh, in the executive branch. So Secretary Smith, is there anything you want to add to that? No. Steve. All right, we'll move to Courtney, local 
Hello? Can you hear me? We can. Hi. Uh, just a quick clarification question regarding uh, campgrounds and outdoor lodging being able to open 100%. And I think you did just uh, touch on it briefly, Governor, but does this mean anyone coming from out of state would need to quarantine at that campsite for 14 days? And would that be up to the owner of the campground to sort of monitor that? Well, again, uh, we have opened up uh, different counties uh, throughout uh, the Northeast region. Uh, so anyone who is, is from those counties can come uh, without quarantining. And we have uh, enhanced our policy uh, for those traveling from the other uh, parts of the Northeast. Uh, they would have to quarantine beforehand uh, and uh, or uh, come to Vermont and uh, after a seven day period have a test and so forth. So. Uh, there are provisions uh, for coming from other parts of the region without the uh, the same 14-day quarantine period. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Colin, seven days. Hi, Governor. Um, I have a question about the defund the police movement. Um, Three Vermont state lawmakers have proposed reallocating 20% of the Vermont state police budget towards social services, uh, which they believe are sort of better poised to handle some of the societal problems, um, poverty, homelessness, et cetera, that police often handle on a daily basis. Um, I believe you said that you don't support the concept of defunding police and would rather focus on reform and modernization. I'm just curious what you say to the activists out there who believe that we are sort of past that point as a society that the only real way to address racial injustice and police abuse is to shrink the footprint of law enforcement. Yeah, I think we can uh, we can do both in some respects. Uh, I don't. Uh, I believe that we have a obligation uh, to. Um, perform public safety as a high uh, priority and that uh, and again uh, the vi visions of public safety are, are different for uh, different people um, from our standpoint we've uh, taken a lot of steps uh, over the last uh, two or three years to try and move in the right in, in that direction whether it's street outreach uh, counselors and so forth uh, embedded to counselors in our state police barracks we we have proposed enhancing uh, that provision in this past budget and so forth but um, we, um, I don't, I don't believe there's 20% uh, to to cut uh, in law enforcement at this point in time. But we do need to change the way we're training, I believe, uh, and uh, and also enhance uh, um, some of the mental health uh, providers, uh, counselors, and so forth. Uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything to add to that? Thank you, Governor. I think you uh, covered it at a macro level. Uh, earlier this year, uh, we proposed a suite of modernization initiatives that included many of the things folks are talking about now, including uh, enhanced mental health and social service provision, uh, expanding those programs statewide where they only exist in, in some areas now. Um, it is no secret that the, uh, the scope of things that uh, police officers and law enforcement are called to today uh, continues to increase, so we're very much on board with uh, expanding resources to ensure that we're sending the right resources at the right time. Uh, all that said, um, reducing budgets uh, is likely not in the cards. Uh, there's a, a variety of investments that we need to make to stay modern and contemporary, particularly as the governor noted in training uh, and also in information technology. And just a quick follow-up for you, Governor. If a budget were to make its way to your desk, that did propose a 10, 20 percent, something along the lines of what's being requested, would you not support that? Yeah. I, again, what, like with all other pieces of legislation, um, I, 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 I'd rather see uh, the legislation, see what it actually says um, before committing one way or the other. So I, I would uh, obviously, we would be part of the conversation along the way. And, uh, and then determine at that point whether we would support it or not. So, so just, the, I mean, it's not a non-starter, though? Well, nothing's a non-starter. Um, you know, I, I do value uh, the legislative input, um, and I think that some of the dialogue, some of the discussion is important, uh, in, if nothing else, uh, to uh, fully vet uh, some of the, the proposals and ideas and and people want to be heard, and, and that's part of the challenge uh, and part of the frustration many have is they just don't feel as though they've been heard. So we need to listen. 
uh, and we need to at least contemplate this. But uh, be happy to weigh in when this uh, becomes a reality and gets closer, uh, because I'm sure we'll have a seat at the table. Thank you. Joel Burlington Free Press. Yeah, um, hello, Governor. Yes. Um, I, yeah, hi. Um, I have uh, a question about testing, and this may be, um, part of this might, I, I believe is for Dr. Levine. I'm pretty sure all and of it is. is. <laughs> no, part two is, is just for you. <laughs> Um, the uh, so for for the nasal swab testing, this is for Dr. Levine. How useful would it be to the health department and all Vermonters if folks submitted to the nasal swab test, even if they're feeling perfectly fine? I mean, have they, if they've been out some. Uh, is this would this be a burden on the health department if suddenly you had 80 percent of a burlington resident just show up and get the swab test so that's that's my first question and the second question uh perhaps perhaps for the governor uh as i was on furlough last week and my wife and i were walking on prospect here in Burlington and noticed the pop-up test site uh, that the Army National Guard had. And we sort of hummed and hawed and we're feeling fine, but, you know, there's some natural reluctance just to say, okay, let's, let's do, it, do it for the team. And we finally decided, yeah, hey, we'll just, let's do what it's like. And um, it's, it's uncomfortable and, and it's, it's no worse than getting a nose full of pollinated pool water, I think. Um, but I'd be interested in knowing from uh, from you, Governor, how, if, if, if these tests are useful in the general population, how might we uh, better persuade people to do it? And um, I don't know if there'd be an incentive. I mean, maybe, maybe a Tootsie Roll, uh, or maybe something uh, more substantial or healthy. Um, but anyway, so that's a two-part question, and I apologize for for uh, taking too long to ask it. You know, Joel, uh, at this point in time, we are encouraging people: if you want a test, come get a test. Um, I think that's important. If you have any questions. Uh, you should definitely get to one of the pop-up sites and have the, the tests uh, done. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, I, I believe uh, testing will be changing. Uh, and this is, you know, I, I'm obviously uh, not a physician uh, or part of the health community, but I do believe uh, that the testing is going to get easier at some point. And we're going to, it's going to become more a part of our, our normal lives. Uh, and. Uh, as, at least before a vaccine uh, comes our way. Uh, so I think we'll see mm -hmm. uh, that they're working on this as we speak. I know a number of companies are working on this uh, to make it easier for like uh, going uh, to a large event, a sports event of some sort, where there are thousands, tens of thousands of people going, uh, to have some sort of a testing procedure that's instantaneous. Uh, and that would uh, mm -hmm. alleviate a lot of the concerns uh, people have about attending those events and, and allow the, the events to happen. Um, but, uh, but I'll let Dr. Levine uh, answer, you know, generally the, most of the two parts. I think that the question is almost uh, the same in both, both sections. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Joel. Um, so, Let's talk about the test itself first, um, because you're right. It, it, it all involves the nose, but th there's really two variations on that theme. One is called nasal pharyngeal, which is really stuck, the, the swab is stuck way in the back of your nose. Um, so that would be mildly uncomfortable for some people. Uh, it's fairly quick, so that's the good news. We would like to ultimately replace that completely with what's called just a nasal swab, which is actually the front of the nose. 
which a person could actually do themselves under observation. We're doing that in children. We're doing that in a lot of nursing home patients. We would like to do it in most people, but for the shortage of the swabs that are needed to actually do it that way, because they're a different type of a swab. But we are gaining more uh, access to those swabs, and once we can really have a vibrant number of them, that will be the test that we do. Probably just in time, for it to be replaced by another test. So the, the, the goal you know, for the future is to actually have uh, a saliva test. And if the saliva test works, you can imagine that's way easier for a person to uh, produce and give to somebody than having a person geared up in PPE and, and sticking the swab into the back of someone's nose. So, so that's the ultimate goal, is to make it much more user-friendly uh, for both sides, the collection side and the person who's giving their specimen. Um, we certainly have, as we're showing, capacity to do a lot of tests per day and per week. And we're talking close to 10,000 tests in a week uh, that were done. If you think about the combined populations of Burlington and Winooski, that's um, you know, a little over 50 to 55,000 people uh, just in those areas. So it wouldn't be a reach to say we could actually test 80% of all of those people uh, over a period of time uh, if there was a desire for that to happen for them. Um, certainly from a public health standpoint, it might be interesting and useful information, though I couldn't tell every person it was important for them to do it uh, just to see the extent of this outbreak, which we think we've kind of uh, begun to understand at this point in time. So okay. that's kind of the answer to your question. I think the governor is correct that, you know, if there's a long period that goes by without a vaccine, with people having to live in this sort of trying to restart but not quite getting there 100% yet and wondering when they can go to a basketball game, when they can go to a concert, et cetera, Perhaps there will be a sufficient point of care, if you will, testing technology where that can be your ticket to admission, so to speak, uh, and you're, you're allowed to be in such a mass gathering because at least at that point in time, your test was negative, and that's all people need to know to be more comfortable being in that setting with you. So, um, wow. you know, I would hope we actually don't get to that point because with all the vaccine candidates that are being uh, examined now, and a couple are being very much fast-tracked to later phase trials, not just phase one or two, but trying to get to phase three, maybe we won't have to go through a long period of time. But um, maybe that's wishful thinking as well. So time will tell. All right, well, thank you both. Appreciate it. All right, and uh, Commissioner Pichek did get an answer to Aaron's question on why we went from 40 to 500 monitoring. Commissioner Pichek, could you share that? Yes, uh, thank you, Rebecca. So um, as of uh, today, actually June 15th, the uh, uh, Department of Health is including uh, in the uh, persons uh, under monitoring category those that have registered with SARA Alert, including those that are traveling, um, you know, returning from travel back to Vermont. Uh, and those also that are close contacts with people with COVID-19. So I think that first piece, people traveling to Vermont from out of state, um, either to the state or back uh, into the state is a new category, which accounts for the jump in the number. Aaron, are you still on the line? Hmm. We can relay that directly to Aaron as well. We wanted everybody to get that update. And that was it for today's question. Great. Thank you very much for tuning in. And on Wednesday, we'll be talking about long-term care facilities. Thank you very much. Thank you.